Well, thank you so much, uh, Deb, Kathleen, and Ethan. Uh, that was that was a, a great uh, provocation for all of us. And there we got to, I think, two of about twenty-two questions. So from the audience, so we'll 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 keep track of those. Um, we're gonna gonna switch gears and look at um, both the the public policy and operational side of uh, of these questions. We have uh, two fantastic uh, panelists just to get going. Uh, Karen and Colin, if you would um, uh, turn on your video and audio so that you can there you, I see Karen, I see Colin, fantastic. Great to see you both. Um, so I'm gonna quickly uh, introduce uh, our two speakers uh, and then we'll, we'll dive right in. Uh, I, I will say that we have, I think a, a huge store of challenges uh, built up already from, from the first panel. The, um, I'm sure both, both Karen and Colin, interestingly enough, did a huge amount of work what, 25 or 30 years ago on problems of interoperability in telecom networks. So it seems that uh, some of these questions uh, come back. Uh, we used to call it interconnection, right? Um, uh, so to begin with, uh, we have Karen Kornblue, who's the senior fellow and director of the Digital Information Innovation and Democracy Initiative at the German Marshall Fund. Um, this is an initiative that, that Karen started um, uh, Karen has such a, a long history as a pioneer in technology policy. I'll just highlight a few of her contributions. Uh, she was a, a real leader in the development implementation of the E-rate at the Federal Communication Commission in the 1990s, which was really a, a pivotal uh, uh, set of policies that, that brought affordable internet access to schools and libraries. I don't think we understood, maybe you understood, but I don't think the world understood how important that was going to be. Um, uh, but we're obviously reaping the benefits uh, of Colin that now. And Colin, and Colin had something to do with that too. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, Karen was the policy director for then uh, Senator Barack Obama during his time in the Senate and was then named as US ambassador to the OECD um, uh, where she actually worked with Taylor um, uh, and, and led uh, the effort of, 20, of 35 countries in the OECD to adopt uh, uh, an important new set of internet policy making principles that actually address many of the questions we're talking about today. And she's now at the German Marshall Fund and really delighted to have you, Karen. Uh, Colin Crowell uh, um, was most recently the vice president for global public policy at Twitter Colin, I believe, was the first policy hire at Twitter um, in around uh, 2011. Do I have that right, That's Colin? Right. Um, uh, coming from a really uh, extraordinary career as a senior congressional uh, staff member for now Senator, then uh, Representative uh, Ed Markey from Massachusetts, um, Colin uh, led a lot of the work on the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which brought us, among other, among other things, uh, Section 230, um, uh, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, and, and the E-rate, and lots of other important technology policy developments. So um, uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Karen first, and then Colin, and ask you to, to share some thoughts. Um, make sure you... Um, uh, don't leave out what you came here to talk about. We could we could dive right into the questions, uh, of course, that are left over from the last panel. But uh, we we do want to hear um, your your opening perspectives for eight minutes each, and then and then we'll go to uh, roundtable discussion and audience questions. So, audience, uh, save up your questions. Um, I I am going to look at questions that start at the. Um, uh, at the 3.15 uh, time mark in the Q&A. So if you have questions that you want to re-up uh, that you think will be relevant to this panel, uh, please just, just repost them because otherwise I can't promise I'll see them. Uh, so uh, Karen, take it away. I just had a flashback, Danny. I remember the first time I met you and it, uh -oh. was, <laughs> it was pre-96 Act and we were talking about interoperability or interconnection or whatever it was called. And I remember sitting in Ed Markey's office when Colin and he came up with the term E-rate. We were like, that'll never catch on. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So I, 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 by, 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 by that, what I want to say is I think I bring a different perspective than the first panel um, in that I come from, um, I do policy research and I've worked in uh, various domestic policy um, settings from the Senate to the Federal Communications Commission during the implementation, uh, negotiation and implementation of the 96 Act, um, which was about bringing competition to the underlying telecom network um, and uh, trying to create space for this nascent internet thing, um, and 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 then dealing internationally with how to make the globe safe for the spread of the internet, and then over to the Treasury Department, where I served on the White House task force that set forth the inter early internet policy framework that Danny was talking about at the beginning. Um, I've also worked in politics, which I'll explain why that's relevant in a minute, and um, in business, not in the social media business, but at, in management consulting and um, uh, um, in uh, the uh, leadership of a, of a ad tech uh, rating company. And by which to say, like, I think I understand a little bit about how the incentives work inside a, a company. And so I want to... I want to expand the lens a bit. Um, I thought Danny set out, you know, what that framework is that we think of that governs the internet. And I just want to, I want to, I don't think it's wrong at all, but I want to widen the lens in two ways. One is um, let's look um, beyond 230 to some of the other policy frameworks that exist that we don't think of when it comes to the internet and often haven't been applied to the internet. So what's one of those? Competition policy, which is recently really being applied to the internet. Um, it was certainly applied to the underlying networks as we've discussed, um, but, uh, but thinking about how to apply that is, is, uh, requires a lot of updating, rethinking, you know, what does it mean when these companies don't charge anything to consumers? Uh, how do we think about antitrust in this new environment? How do we think about competition policy? So that's being rethought. Um, Campaign finance. When Citizens United was decided by the Supreme Court, uh, that was in 2010. So social media was nascent. That was the when we thought it was going to bring democracy to the Middle East. The majority opinion in Citizens United said, we don't need to worry about limiting corporate donations because there's this new thing called the internet, which will bring trans total transparency. So shareholders, citizens will know if some corporation is trying to influence a, um, a candidate. And when we hear about the Honest Ads Act, which is one of the few bipartisan pieces of legislation, what that's about is updating our campaign finance laws for this new environment. Um, you know, all, all kinds of problems, but it would say, let's have the same kind of transparency about political ads line as we have in the broadcast realm. Um, consumer protection, you know, we, we think, you know, obviously we want free expression. We value the first amendment, but you can't, you can't, uh, defraud consumers. That's not considered okay. And so we have the federal trade commission and they have powers to enforce and they, they can be more aggressive or get more authorities under current authority. They can do quite a lot, but they could do more on things like, uh, deep fakes or possibly even dark patterns or, or other kinds of issues. And then there's just more um, law enforcement on illegal activities that happen online, whether it has to do with children or targeted harassment um, and so on. So I, I just want to widen the lens that way. And then one area that Danny's been really involved in, but you didn't mention is because it's, it's hard to explain, but this early in the early days, self-regulation didn't mean no regulation, didn't mean every platform could do exactly what it wanted, you know, and change their mind day to day. There were examples of the industry coming together and adopting uh, common approaches, often with the threat of regulation in the background, and often with some kind of enforcement that if you didn't comply, uh, it would be a consumer protection violation or regulation might come to be. Um, so that's one what kind of policy um, tool or framework that we can update for the current problems. Another way I want to widen the lens is not just on the policy side, but also not just to focus on 
the platform moderation problem, which unfortunately leads us into this whole whack-a-mole conversation and who should decide what's true and what's not true and what's dangerous and not. Should it be the government? Should it be the platforms? Um, but I think we need to do, and Kathleen was doing some of this earlier, and I found it's just mind-blowing what she was showing us. We've done a different research uh, that shows very complementary things about some of the actors uh, online, who's perpetrating this? So I, I'm interested in the disinformation, not the misinformation. Who's purposely spreading this? How are they doing it? Are there, what's the supply chain of these conspiracy theories? Who's doing it and to what ends? And what we find is there are these super spreaders. So I think people have become really aware of how the algorithm spreads things, but it's not just the algorithm that's amplifying disinformation. There are these outlets online or really websites that pose as news outlets that have enormous reach that NewsGuard, which tries to use some kind of objective uh, rating has found you know, re repeatedly put out provably false dis uh, information or engage in really shoddy practices, you know, slapping a headline on content that has nothing to do with the underlying content. And a few of these outlets, you know, have just enormous reach online. Um, and then there are coordinated pages that promote them. We, uh, some of our research led to the takedown of a bunch of pages of um, health misinformation, COVID misinformation that had a reach uh, greater than, it had interactions greater than the WHO and the CDC combined. Uh, so I think if we look at the supply chain and then what that leads me to is what are the design elements? What, what are the platforms doing or not doing? How are they built? What are their settings that allow this supply chain to exist, that allow things that are not journalism to pose as journalism and to get your trust that they're journalism, that allow these pages to coordinate, that allow these groups that Kathleen was talking about to pull you into a conspiracy theory in a public group and then radicalize you further into a private group and for you know, reopen, then you're convinced to be an anti-vaxxer, then you're convinced 5G is dangerous, then you're convinced that somebody's going to take away your guns and you better stop the steal. Um, so, so I think there are design elements that we need to think of um, as opposed to the whack-a-mole. And I'll just, I'll just quickly say the three areas that my, my co-author Ellen Goodman and I just had a piece in the post and what we tried to talk, we tried to simplify this down and say there are three kinds of approaches. And I think this is where it dovetails with, with panel one. One is we need to update some of these offline laws and regulations and so on. A second is we need to update some of the norms. And that's where we might want some kind of code of conduct, you know, for things that are, are harmful, but are never going to be illegal, where it's really about the terms of service and how can the platforms change their design uh, to be more transparent, to put more friction. I know Twitter has been doing a lot of interesting work on this to create more friction around disinformation, maybe a circuit breaker. So some, something like this pandemic video that had something like 12, 20 million views in 12 hours before the, all three platforms took it down for violating its terms of service. If there'd been a circuit breaker where they could have said, okay, instead of waiting till after our content moderation, moderators watch the 40 minute video, debate it, et cetera, we're gonna put a pause in amplifying it. Not take it down, but not amplify it. Uh, so things like that. And then the third bucket, um, what do we do about our civic information? How do we boost truthful content? What are the techniques? And this is what you guys were talking about earlier. What, what do we need to do to fund, but also to think about um, the equivalent of libraries, the equivalent of the kinds of games that QAnon is. QAnon is a multiplayer game in many ways. How do we make the truth engaging? Um, how do we use storytelling techniques, et cetera? What, how do we think about the PBS of the internet, if you will? Um, what's the civic internet infrastructure? And I think it's those three elements that I think can help us think about how do we change the incentives of the platforms. I think it was interesting, somebody said, you know, they think of moderation as a cost center, um, they want as much virality as possible to keep people online, you know, and then, and with talking about designated drivers, I think about seatbelts in that same analogy to cars that, um, that the auto companies weren't going to put in seatbelts until their incentives were changed and they had to do it. They put them in, it hasn't been a catastrophe for the car industry, but it solved a big externality, which was death. 
Um, so I think we have to think about, about um, you know, these three buckets of things to ch change the incentives. Thank you, Karen. That's great. So Colin, um, you, you've had time in the policymaking world. You had time as the recipient of a lot of policy uh, coming at you and a lot of public expectation. And now you have a little chance to reflect on all of it. So, so how does this sound to you? Yeah, no, thank you, Danny. And um, thank you for the invitation uh, today. It's great to be with our colleagues here and with some old friends. Um, and just reflecting back to your opening and, and some of the comments on section uh, 230, one of the things that um, I was just remembering was that the bill that was introduced that would eventually become uh, section 230 when it was added to the House version of the Telecom Act in the summer of 1995. That bill as introduced was called the Internet Freedom and Family Empowerment Act. And I think we understand the internet freedom part of it, but the Family Empowerment Act was very present uh, in our minds at the time because of a concern about an alternative that was in the Senate bill, which would have uh, had the government, Big Brother, regulating internet content uh, more directly. And also the fact that we wanted to make sure that the people, internet users themselves were empowered to help navigate their own experience on the internet. Now, of course, this was pre-social media, um, but it was at a nascent time in the internet's development. 1995 was the year of the Netscape IPO, for example. So the internet was just, you know, sort of getting launched at that time. And I think uh, looking back at those roots of internet freedom and family empowerment, uh, we can see the benefit of the policy over time, particularly internationally, where US policymaking leadership as reflected globally has availed users in many other places in the world uh, to benefit from that policy, oftentimes through US uh, multinationals. But when you get to the toxin that has now come into the media ecosystem in the form of disinformation. Uh, I think uh, Ethan's uh, analogy earlier uh, and framework around uh, a health uh, framework uh, is good. And, and Deb uh, certainly will recall at Twitter, we were using health of the public conversation uh, as you know, one of our organizing uh, frameworks for the work that we were doing at, at Twitter, safeguarding the health of the public conversation. One thing that has struck me as I think back, uh, uh, you know, where we've come and where we are, is that when I joined Twitter as its first public policy hire in 2011, uh, Twitter was 140 characters and a link. And if you click the link, it took you somewhere else. It took you to YouTube or a website. And it was essentially a short text uh, service and a pointing service. It pointed to other places on the internet. Now, over time, Twitter became more informationally uh, rich, more media rich. Uh, it now has the ability to show photos, videos, uh, GIFs, GIFs if you prefer, uh, and uh, screenshots. And you can go live from your handset and everybody can become a broadcaster, essentially, uh, on Twitter. And that's common across many of the uh, social media apps uh, at this point as well. And so in an informationally media rich ecosystem where Twitter today now serves something just north of 5,000 tweets per second globally, dealing with content moderation at scale is not simple. And I think Kathleen's presentation earlier uh, rang true for me uh, uh, significantly because she talked about the difficulty in classification. What is disinformation? How do you classify it in order to analyze it, in order to uh, perhaps train algorithms on it? Uh, how do you think about things like sa satire, irony, sarcasm, mockery? And that's just text. How do you think of slang? Then what do you do with memes? Uh, and, you know, how does that, you know, if you have 280 characters now, uh, that's one thing, but as they say, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So how do you handle that uh, information again at 
at global scale. And it's not easy. I think Karen made a good point, uh, you know, talking about uh, uh, disinformation and looking at uh, the health uh, of the ecosystem. And I think the abiding goal, certainly at Twitter, but I think the abiding goal that we should have for the various public squares on the internet is to make sure that it is serving up to uh, the people who use those services, informationally nutritious content. Uh, there will always be rumor mongering uh, and there will always be misinformation, uh, perhaps that's inaccurate, but not uh, being shared nefariously necessarily. Uh, but now we have to deal with state sponsored uh, information operations. Coming out of the 2016 US election, one of the things that we did in our retrospective review at Twitter of what occurred on that platform was to look at uh, automation, uh, to look at uh, fake accounts, uh, inauthentic ways of uh, propagating information and to come up with countermeasures uh, to that. Going from 140 characters and a link to the experience over the last year of creating speed bumps on Twitter's platform, having people pause a moment with a prompt to say, do you wanna read this article before you share it? And just getting people to pause for a second, uh, applying labels uh, to certain accounts and applying uh, flags to certain content uh, was a way of pointing people to uh, alternative sources of information and flagging that the veracity coefficient, so to speak, on some of the information being shared was being questioned by others. And here's uh, more trusted sources of information that you could take a look at. Uh, you know, one of the things that's difficult in politics and political campaigns is a lot of times somebody will uh, share something on Facebook or, or, or Twitter and I'll look at it in the heat of a campaign and I'll say, that's wrong. It's just flat out wrong. And then because I'm a fair-minded person, I might look at it again and I'll take a look and I'll say, well, it's not 100% wrong. There's a smidgen of it. There's a grain of truth to it. But one side of the political debate will be screaming fake news, fake news, fake news. But the other side of the debate will be saying, no, that just happens to be our perspective on this issue. And so sometimes a lot of what people point to as uh, disinformation or fake news uh, can be highly charged political rhetoric, political rhetoric often exaggerated for effect uh, in the heat of a campaign. And that's very hard uh, to navigate, very difficult to navigate. I think one of the things that I've been hopeful for uh, as Trump has not, uh, I wasn't thinking that he would be exiting uh, all the social media platforms, but as he exited the presidency, was that we would be able to talk about policy without him being the elephant in the room. Now, of course, he's going to be the elephant that's not in the room, uh, <laughs> but he will still be part of this debate because it'll be hard for people to think about how do you handle disinformation and how do you protect democratic processes in the open public squares of the internet when you had a democratically elected head of state who was responsible for sharing disinformation, whether it was about vaccine uh, COVID related information or about the election uh, results themselves or the election. So that is very, very complicated terrain for any uh, company to, to navigate. Uh, and I think this is where uh, the benefit of having uh, a, a process and policy underway now that is looking at market power and looking through an antitrust prism uh, at you know, perhaps some of the defects in the current market situation with an eye toward remedies that could provoke greater competition, provoke interoperability or require interoperability, but also increase uh, the health of the public conversation more broadly, I, I think should be the abiding goals as we go there. I'll pause there because I, I find often with these things, it's best to uh, spend most of the time on, on questions. Great. Thank you so much, Colin. And thanks, Karen. I want to ask you each 
two questions and then we'll go to uh, David uh, Edelman. I'll then, I'll then uh, turn to you uh, to bring us home for the last 15 minutes. Um, uh, so I think if you look at the, the kind of range of responses that we've been talking about here, both in uh, your various presentations, the first panel presentations and some of the questions, there's a, there's a set of questions about how to, how to discipline or better manage, better incentivize, whatever you want to say, the current environment. Uh, that is, is, is are, are, the, are the current players getting the right signals? And then there's a set of questions about what we might do differently. Could we encourage alternative uh, styles of interaction, alternative platforms, uh, alternative sources of information, et cetera. So there's, there's, there's these two areas where I want to ask you each to, to think kind of one after the other about the policy interventions that we might think about. And I guess my first question to each of you is, um, do you think the, the platforms today are getting the right signals from government? Are they getting uh, uh, enough uh, guidance? Are they getting too much guidance? Um, and just what what are the kinds of interventions that you think either are working or uh, would would work uh, to kind of help manage the the current environment? Putting aside for the moment whether we could produce something that's substantially different. Karen. I think the platforms themselves have said they're not getting enough guidance. Um, I think they would rather not be making some of these. I think sometimes it seems a little disingenuous. Sometimes Mark Zuckerberg seems to be suggesting that he's waiting for a world government to say what's true and what's not. Uh, but I do think they could use a little more guidance. I mean, right now, as someone on the first panel said, um, uh, Keeping people online, which we all know, uh, incent we've learned come to learn a lot of this incendiary uh, content keeps people online. Um, conspiracy theory keeps people online is associated with revenue because of uh, eyeballs leading to ad dollars and moderation friction uh, are co either cost centers or reduce revenue. And so you need some guidance. Uh, I think for either from government or I think the industry needs to come together. And, and where would I start? The very first thing I think about is this initial value of the internet, which is transparency. And I, uh, you know, I think part of the big design flaw is as somebody on the first panel said, it's not just the individual piece of content is a lie and you're an idiot and you believe it. It's that the provenance of the information is hidden, is disguised. So you don't know that it didn't come from a reputable journalistic outlet. You don't know that it was shared with a bot or with a network of pages that have an interest in sharing this information from this outlet uh, or that this influencer you know, is sharing it for a certain either financial or political reason. So I think a lot more, and you don't understand how the content moderation is working. So for instance, in after the 2016 election, the reason we know that the Russians targeted African-Americans with so much disinformation and voter suppression was because the Senate Intelligence Committee required disclosure of a lot of that data. Otherwise we wouldn't have it. So I think, I think both in terms of, I, I think mostly we, we need to find a way and, and Twitter has just made an announcement and now Facebook that they are going to make some more data available, which I think is really, really important. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out. But that's one place I would start. Yeah. And then again, I think just updating a lot of these offline yeah. uh, uh, regulations and funding um, and thinking about how to amplify some of the good content. Oh, thank you. Colin, do you, looking back on your time at Twitter or just observing the platforms generally, are there ways that you would like to see more uh, affirmative guidance or control or change in conditions. You mentioned the, the competition environment, which is a huge question that's probably a little too big for us to really get into here. But um, uh, do, do, you, do you feel like the balance is right or, or should there be, would you like to see more government steering? I think, you know, there are certain things that I think the government could help clarify. So for example, 
Um, Twitter last year um, uh, banned political advertising. And it did so in part because it wasn't clear what the rules for political advertising on the internet would be. In the United States, a campaign, a candidate for federal elective office can go to a broadcast television or radio licensee and that licensee has no discretion. They must take the ad and under uh, the favorable uh, rules that the government itself set up, uh, must offer them the lowest uh, price available for airing that ad at that time. If it's a cable television news channel or cable TV channel, that's not a broadcast licensee. They have discretion. They don't have to take the ad. So you have two different rules on a cable system. Most consumers don't know whether one channel is still over the air broadcast and if the other is just cable TV, but it's not clear what rules apply to the internet. Twitter made the decision that simply taking advertising from political candidates and taking that money for paid reach uh, was antithetical to the work we were otherwise trying to do at that time to set up for a healthy public conversation for the 2020 elections. And our CEO said at the time that political speech should be earned. The reach of political speech should be earned. It should not be bought and paid for. And so that was a decision Twitter had the discretion to make and took. Facebook obviously made a different decision. Uh, and so every company was sort of up to themselves on how uh, they did it. That would be something that would, could be clarified by the Congress, including the disclosures of how information about uh, political ads would be there. So that's there are, there are examples like that. Yeah. I think one of the bigger things though that I think is often missed is that uh, many policymakers are still focused on a kind of traditional way of thinking about internet content that they don't like. And they see internet content that they don't like and they want to ban it or they want to censor it. They want to get it off the internet. And there'll be a variety of reasons why they want that to protect kids or you know, whatever it may be. But one of the things that becomes incredibly difficult as governments and regulators say to the, cat, to the companies, you must ban or censor this and we want the takedowns to occur within 24 hours, is that as the internet evolves and as the networks evolve, it may be the case that we see a migration to social media, to other parts of the internet that we see currently in cryptocurrency uh, uh, infrastructure today, which is the migration of blockchain and so you may reach a point where it becomes harder and harder to technically say something must be removed or eliminated, depending on how the infrastructure of the service works. So I think a focus that looks at uh, the algorithms around discoverability, the recommendation algorithms, how do consumers find content? Uh, I think an example earlier, like if I go searching for content in a particular part of the internet and I find it, uh, that was my choice. I took proactive measures, proaction to, to get there. But if things are being suggested to me, if they are, are prominent in search results, those are kinds of the things about uh, the discoverability, the recommendations and transparency around how that works. And then what are the checks, the speed bumps on virality uh, that can keep an ecosystem healthier? And then finally, the other thing I would say is you have to think of the ecosystem broadly. It's hard to think about uh, what you're seeing on social media if you're not also thinking about cable TV news uh, and the content that's there. Uh, because a lot of the content that comes, and Deb can tell you about the symbiotic relationship between television and uh, social networks uh, uh, like uh, Twitter and journalism and journalistic organizations like um, and, and uh, social media. Uh, that, that relationship isn't going to change. And so if you're not dealing with the source of where a lot of this information is coming, then you're missing a big part of what actually winds up eventually on social media and going viral on social media. Great, thank you. I, I wanna ask you both one final question before we go to the audience questions. Um, and it's, it's about this, the question that has come up about uh, um, efforts to uh, create a more 
presumably dynamic and diverse uh, social media environment through interoperability. So in privacy terms, uh, there's a lot of discussion and requirements in EU law, as you both know, uh, about uh, data portability. So you're supposed to be able to take your data, which might include who your friends are, uh, to some other network. Uh, so if you don't like Facebook, you go somewhere else and you bring your somehow bring your friends. No, it's quite figured that out. Uh, but and there's a lot, a number of 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 questions in the the chat, pointing out that there are a variety of technical means by which you could make uh, this whole social media environment somewhat more fluid, somewhat more decentralized, uh, and enable people to kind of configure their own social networks or enable communities maybe to get to Ethan's ideal of, of just 20,000 people. Um, I, I wanna ask you both about how that sounds from a policy perspective and particularly just ask you to reflect on what seems like uh, tension there that uh, um, uh, if I think it was Ethan who rightly pointed out that when old telecommunications networks were required to uh, interconnect and interoperate, they said it would be really expensive. Um, well, I think in this case, we actually know there is some expense associated with, for example, just managing the identities of all the people on, uh, of all the accounts on social media cost time and money to figure out whether those accounts are legitimate or fraudulent and cost time if people lose their passwords and whatever else, right? So um, in, in, in thinking about this move towards um, greater interoperability, a more dynamic environment, it seems like we are best case kind of diluting the revenue uh, associated with all that activity. And I'm, I guess I wonder where, uh, whether you think that's the right way to look at it, and if so, where uh, do 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 uh, do you think that the costs of managing the environment of protecting the ecosystem, as you said, Colin, or as various people have said, that the public health costs do they do they just kind of get handled on a decentralized way uh, through some decentralized mechanism, or do we actually have to think about where those how those costs will be will be handled? I'm happy to take that first if you yeah, want. Yeah, why don't you go, yeah. Um, well, certainly the echoes of the past are, are, are certainly ringing uh, here because uh, you know the Congress mandated uh, number portability so you could keep your number phone number when you changed carriers. It mandated dialing parity. Many uh, people of a uh, certain vintage will remember that it used to take you extra numbers uh, to reach uh, certain carriers uh, to finish uh, your telecommunications calls. Uh, there were costs associated with that, uh, but the Congress decided that it was in the public interest to mandate it and require it and to force the, uh, the companies, uh, the incumbent companies to do it. And the broader ecosystem benefited as a result and consumers benefited as a result. I think one of the things that you'll see that Twitter is doing through uh, an initiative called Blue Sky is to try to come up with uh, open protocols, uh, sort of social media open protocols that would allow uh, for greater openness uh, and greater movement, uh, perhaps uh, around social media ecosystems, and so uh, that you know is a work in progress. But I think it holds promise for policy uh, because it would avail consumers and companies of the opportunity to cross pollinate uh, services and, and users and to reach people in the same way that you have multiple, yep. you know, email providers. But using a common protocol, we can choose which email provider we want to use, but we can reach people on other networks. The idea is very similar. The other aspect of it is um, not just transparency, but choice, right? Competitive choice and not just choice in your um, social media uh, app of choice, but perhaps choice in the algorithm that you're using within that social media app. If I have a choice for the recommendation algorithm that I want, maybe it recommends, uh, you know, sports, uh, you know, stars to me, or culinary uh, chefs or journalists. Uh, maybe it weeds out uh, legal but harmful content, and it's an algorithm that is built with that and marketed as a family-friendly uh, algorithm in that way. That gets back to your family empowerment. Yeah. 
uh, part of Section 230, which is to encourage that kind of innovation and encourage that kind of activity. I think that's good. There's one right. other and piece. I'm sorry to cut you off. I just want to go to Karen quickly. Yeah. Karen, take two minutes, and then we're going to go to some last audience questions. I, I hate to cut cut this off, but uh, Karen, you have the last word on this, and then we're going to go to questions. Yeah, I hate to be a cynic, but having worked in the ad tech business and having worked in politics, there are bad actors out there or motivated actors, let's say that. Um, and they're going to be there whether you have small networks or big networks. And so I'm all for competition. I think there should be competition. I think the kind of choice that, uh, that Colin is talking about um, is great and should be available. And I think there'd be a lot less qualms if you could pick your algorithm to moderate in that way. V it reminds me of the V-chip. Um, but, uh, but I think we still need to have some rules to protect consumers they can't protect themselves if they don't know who's advertising, not only advertising, because it's not just strictly um, an advertisement, but what what coordinated inauthentic activity, to borrow that phrase, um, what other kinds of um, identity-based activity is going on around them. We need to have some rules of the road that come from law enforcement, FTC, as you know, I hate to sound boring, but, but I think we need to put some, some shackles on uh, the bad actors and change the incentives of the platforms um, to just, just, you know, just have the same kinds of protections we have online that we have offline. Great, Karen, thank you. Uh, David Edelman, uh, well, so uh, if we were in a, you know, proper in-person setting, we would um, uh, applaud uh, both of the panels. Uh, thank you so much uh, for all the insight. and. Um, uh, David, we're going to go to uh, some audience questions with the apology that we only have 10 minutes to do that. We don't want to keep anyone past uh, the appointed end of our two hours, uh, but we promise to um, be back in touch with all of you um, on things that we've learned and hopefully uh, uh, ways that we can, can continue this discussion, hopefully with, with um, all of our extraordinary distinguished um, speakers. So David, uh, can I turn it over to you? Great, thank you. Thank you, Danny, and thank you, Inume, for the first couple of panels. Um, let me first of all thank the audience. We have an incredible number of questions, dozens. We have nine minutes to get to what <laughs> remains. So we're gonna do our very best to just highlight, truncate a couple and, and know that this is the beginning of a conversation that we intend to carry forward. Um, let me just begin with, with one theme that's come up a couple of times uh, and it bridges both panels and it gets back to one of the early questions of internet design and particularly social participation. Um, a lot of individuals uh, here in this panel ask their question anonymously. And a question that came up a couple of times uh, in audience questions uh, is this, you know, Ethan and others have talked about building these new networks to create better neighbors, better citizens. Can we do that and still maintain anonymity? And how much of these policy solutions that we're talking about for Colin and, and Karen that we just heard about, how much of them require piercing that veil a bit? How much of them require loss of some of that anonymity that, as the questioner mentions, uh, also has implications for protecting whistleblowers or uh, those who maybe don't want to be subject to government surveillance? Can we talk a little bit about that from both sides? For, for first, our prior panelists, if uh, Ethan or others have commentary then, then we can come back to the others uh, as well. I'm happy to comment briefly. I, I think it, it's actually a, it, it's a central question, the design of the identity system and um, uh, it, that anonymous or not, or, you know, is, is sort of a binary distinction. And actually what we need to do is design for gradients and the question of who has the authority to peel back which layers of identity is critical. And right now it seems like um, you know, the default setting is that um, authority for the identity system is centralized and, and held by the platform. Um, a logical alternative is to totally decentralize. I think the most interesting um, point in the design space is actually somewhere in the middle where you have trusted community organizations and uh, a central authority that authorizes a federation of community organizations, which in turn have control 
um, a space that is hardly explored. But I think, um, you know, and that, that leads to a certain definition of how anonymous can you be? And when you act poorly, um, who has power to peel back layers of um, and, and uh, reveal identity for what purposes? So uh, we're, we don't, we haven't really explored that space, I think fully. Um, and the most valuable parts of the design space, I believe are unexplored. And there's a long track record around persistent pseudonyms. We um, <clears throat> know that having real name identity doesn't guarantee civility of a space. Uh, Facebook's a pretty good example of that. Um, we know that real name identity doesn't necessarily work in all spaces. Simply knowing that it's someone's name um, doesn't necessarily mean that their speech online has offline implications for them. Uh, this may be why a place like uh, LinkedIn, you know, generally has a better speech culture because there's a sense that your real name in the real world space of searching for a job means that you're going to behave particularly well. But there are certainly spaces over the years where persistent pseudonyms have become really valuable to people uh, and they've wanted to ensure that their reputations uh, are held up. Yes, pure anonymous spaces like 4chan uh, have a deservedly poor reputation for online behavior. Um, but I don't know that simply getting rid of anonymity and sort of forcing ourselves into real name policies actually solve these problems. And then beyond that, they have a lot of um, extreme downsides for people who are exploring identities or searching for information that they don't want uh, connected to their real world identity. So unless others have something to add, I want to make sure we keep moving. We've just got a couple more minutes. A question that was raised that might cover both the market and non-market side of this. Someone raised earlier in the conversation, what about the role of large scale unionization? We haven't talked quite as much about engineers and employees of these companies as actors that might play an independent role in having changing the dynamics. Talked a lot about the market dynamics of the algorithm and of, uh, of, of you know, building number of impressions, et cetera. What about that employee piece? What about whether unionization or otherwise? And certainly this is a question for both those that are studying these companies, but also those that might have worked in them. Uh, you know, thoughts on the role that employees and unions in particular can play in helping to change some of this dynamic? I'll just say one thing, you know, I, I'm really focused on sort of the most vulnerable users and manipulation that leads to great social harm uh, to democracy. And I feel that solutions that only rely on the individual user to be savvier or that rely on the, um, on the employee um, are sort of a failure of our civic imagination. You know, I think we need to protect against the worst kind of consumer fraud, the worst kind of targeted harassment as a democracy by updating our, you know, some of our policies. And I think the industry needs to be expected as large social players um, to step up to some of those challenges. My guess is that around now they're given COVID, given January 16th, they might be willing to do a lot more. I really appreciate the employees and what they're doing. And I really appreciate, appreciate the value of, of media uh, literacy, but I think it's asking too much to ask individuals to shoulder that burden. Yeah, and unionization usually has not in any industry had that kind of an impact um, that we're talking about here. So the, what it would do is help the people who are being used to uh, find disinformation or to monitor pornography sites. It would, you know, help them like live saner lives, but that's about, I don't think it would affect the other things. Given that we have just a few minutes left, let me ask and potentially put some of you on the spot for those who want to do it. We'll try to close this on as practical and as sort of forward-looking a note as possible. You have the ability to, with magic wand, make one public policy change, change to law or change to the way the most significant platforms operate, but it's just one change. What's the one thing that you would put into place today to address the problems as you've characterized them? to get a better world here. And, and I suppose we'll unfairly just go, go around in more or less the order in which folks were, were speaking uh, in the earlier panels. I see a couple of folks unmuted, uh, Ethan, Kathleen, and then others that wanna join in. 
10% tax on surveillance advertising, use the money to create a um, corporation for public infrastructure, which funds research and investment in internet services that are used for the public good. All in one sentence with three complete options. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan. Others who want to chime in with their, their one sentence fix, knowing that there is no one sentence fix to this, but food for thought for our next conversation. So I'll say that building an, um, an, a national uh, algorithm accountability office to go in and make sure that the uh, companies or algorithms were actually doing what they claim um, publicly that they're doing would go a long way. You know, I proposed creating a civic communication core. This is uh, Politico asked a few of us to submit ideas for the Biden administration. That was mine, which is a, a human first um, pro-social network and um, to, to mobilize that. I think it's if the political will is there, um, that would be a good idea. Fantastic. Karen? I like that one. Can I steal that one? Plus um, one. Please, it's all yours. Uh, but I guess, I guess um, just based off my last comment, I hate to pick one of one of these um, ideas because they're all so interesting. But I, I just think getting the, um, now that we have a new administration, uh, getting people who are bilingual in tech and policy placed in these agencies so they can think about how to update some maybe antiquated rules and what are the big challenges and how can they apply them, um, I think would be, would be a starting place. And even if they're, they're using their convening power, but especially if they're updating some of the protections uh, from the offline world, I think that would be incredibly uh, helpful, but we really need to have more capacity and more tech savvy. Fantastic. And Colin, last word. Yeah, I, it's hard. It's hard to pick one. If it, maybe one would be get rid of the filibuster, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> which which could then take care of a lot of things. But um, maybe maybe making it clear that the Federal Trade Commission has the authority to establish rules and a regulatory framework uh, for big tech, and just give them that charge. Don't have Congress, uh, you know, fiddling around with Section Two Thirty and driving up. Uh, costs for all these nascent competitors and, you know, turning the future of the internet over to lawyers and the courts, just regulate them directly. Uh, that's the direction Europe is going, Australia, some of the other countries, just make them come up with a, with a basic regulatory framework for the future. It'll be hard, uh, but at this point, there really isn't an alternative. And many of the companies, frankly, would embrace it. In, um, uh, but I wouldn't give up on the antitrust route either. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Colin. Thank you to all of our panelists. We're a little bit over time. We won't hold longer, but as you can tell, this is going to be a continuing conversation. Thank you all of us who joined uh, over the last two hours and uh, really appreciate your participation. Look forward to continuing to engage with you all and thanks for your time. Have thank a great you afternoon. All. Bye.